going on? Hey, man. How you doing? Can you hear me? Do you, is your internet like, uh, <laughs> we need to get you a Starlink in addition to a new webcam? In addition to a haircut, in addition to all the things. Um, you can hear me okay? Yeah, I'm sick yeah. today, so. Uh, oh. My takes are especially bad. I blame it on uh, the diseases that <laughs> you know toddlers bring home from the park and, and other kid-related stuff. Although, I mean, at this point, Fauci has admitted that uh, it is a is it a lab grown virus that they did fund? So, you know, could could be another thing from Wuhan. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm John had a tweet that was like, COVID sh ships faster up, you know, like the, the lab ships faster updates to COVID than uh, than startups ship. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was not, good. not my startup. My startup ship, ships. Daily, yeah. So. yeah, well, this is a good segue into what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about kind of like a 2023 recap of like some of the biggest things that we thought happened last year that, um, you know, might segue into what, uh, what this year will bring. And I also want to do a bit of an update on our respective startups, uh, you know, Farcaster and Turpentine and, um, Sh shill yeah. episode basically a, a, a little bit. Advertisement. Or, or... I, know, I know the fans love when you uh, do the advertisements on the podcast, so maybe they can just tune yeah, exactly. out <laughs> one, yeah, one, exactly. Hour and a half long advertisement. Yeah, thank you Shopify, thank you NetSuite. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, reveal behind the curtains of uh, what's uh, what's going on and what's to, what's to come in twenty twenty four. So let's uh, l let's begin with with some of the the recap on twenty twenty three. I'll, I'll start by saying just one of the the big things for me that we talk about on the show is is this kind of big vibe shift uh, that that was I think most precipitated by by Elon buying Twitter. Which uh, or or and you know turning into X and just sort of doing a you know entire takeover redo, doing the Twitter files and and a couple of big things he did was one is he sort of changed what was uh what was banned so he he uh, he unbanned a lot of accounts um, and then you can now have conversations on the platform that you couldn't have historically whether it was about crime statistics whether it was about trans or whether it was about certain topics that were untouchable. Um, so that's one thing he did. But then the other thing he did was he just started weighing in on all these topics that were previously considered um, sort of beyond the pale. Um, and and I'll list the topics in a second, but you were only allowed to have one opinion on, on, on these topics. And now you can have multiple opinions or you, you can have the, the, the conflicting uh, or, or contradictory opinions. And we now have much more intellectual diversity uh, you know, I, someone remarked in the in the chat how, and by someone, I, I'll just say that it was me. <laughs> I remarked in the chat how all in it sometimes feels like Fox News for tech. I mean, and they even had Tucker Carlson. And it, you just listen to an episode in 2020 of all in and listen in 2023. And it's just it's it, it's remarkable the the difference in tone, how, how open people are. E either they are just much more open or they've evolved their their thinking on certain topics. And just to list some of these topics. You, you were only supposed to have one opinion on uh, things like uh, BLM, on things like uh, DEI, on things like uh, sort of what's happening at the border, on things like, uh, you know, the origin of COVID, on things like crime statistic, on, on things like wokeness at large. There was sort of only one acceptable perspective. And over time, whether it was Elon weighing in or other people weighing in, there was, you know, there was a, a contrary opinion on all of those topics. And um, like in the beginning, it was it was censored, and now people just kind of ignore it or or memory hole it or, or or whatever. And if you start to see enough of these topics happen, it's hard not to say, "Oh wait, how did we censor this thing back then? Like, how do we reconcile the, this thing?" Like, not everyone can. If, if you pay attention, you notice, which is the which is the term term of art in in, in the in sort of in this world. Um, it's hard not to keep noticing. So it feels like there's this this great um, vibe shift or sort of introduction of uh, intellectual diversity or, or polarization, which some people think is is bad and some people think is is good uh, because like North Korea could use some polarization, for example, if if everyone believes uh, one thing or you can only say one thing, having more diversity is 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 good and and sometimes. 
the, uh, the, the, the negative of polarization is, uh, is uniformity. And it, and it feels like we had that a little bit and, and now we have some intellectual diversity. Yeah, I mean, if I was to kind of, there, there are three things that have changed the vibe shift, like from an input standpoint in, in kind of order, I think Elon taking over Twitter, just because that, that is the public square. And he, he took away the blue checks, right? So he, he, he actually removed, you know, we, we had Curtis on last week and Curtis talks about how the idea of a regime change and, and he always talks about East Germany. And you take the Stasi and you just, you retire them overnight and you put them as, give them pensions and they go off and do other things, but they, they lose all of their power. Um, obviously it's a much more informal structure, but the blue check regime ended in one swoop. That was the single biggest thing that happened on Twitter. And you had all these kind of journalists throw hissy fits and, and go to Mastodon and then Blue Sky. And then now they, they seem to have congregated mostly on threads. Um, but the reality is they thought that they were going to be able to pull their audience, right? Like people, th they, they conflated the idea that they were important in the previous regime on Twitter, as in what they were putting out there was important. When the reality is the majority of the audience is, is the habit is Twitter. Like they, they, they're there for Twitter and the entertainment of Twitter. And if you disappear from Twitter, you lose relevance. And so you've seen a lot of them crawling back or anytime they want to share anything important, they still put it on Twitter and then they go have a kind of sidebar conversation and, and point and say, hey, look at all these people on Twitter when the reality is they continue to use Twitter. So I think Twitter changing is actually the single biggest thing there. But I would also say that the second thing is that Zerp ended. And I think the luxury beliefs uh, that, that kind of that the last five to 10 years in Silicon Valley with Trump, especially um, the teeth is all gone because now those people can't demand these kind of crazy policies um, from their employers, right? Like you, you, you know, what is it, James Damore and like the stuff that was happening at Google, that was a result of, of a extremely tight job market and, you know, everyone's making all this money. And so the idea is in order to keep talent, you need to kind of you, you cancel Antonio when he joins Apple, right? Like, and I think that that's just so far gone at this point, right? Like companies are doing layoffs all the time. So I think people are a little bit more, um, you know, like shut up and dribble is, is the term, but like the idea is like shut up and code, like y you're not as a special snowflake as you thought you were. And then I think just from a startup standpoint, Brian Armstrong, I want to give him credit. He, he took it when it was a true contrarian position Prior to going public, the New York Times tried to kind of do a decapitation like they did to Travis with a series of articles, you know, Coinbase is racist against black people, Coinbase is money laundering. And Nathaniel Popper basically quit journalism because he, he, he wasn't able to uh, beat Brian Armstrong. And, and so Coinbase went public, uh, you know, it's had a big up and down. It's, it's back now. So, you know, RIP Fintwit that thought it was circling the drain. But um and, and he's vanquished his enemies in terms of uh, SBF and, and CZ. So like, you know, good, good for Brian. So w go woke, go broke and like, you know, de-woke and, and do okay, right? And I think Toby at Shopify is a much more uh, kind of centrist or you know, it hasn't been as extreme, right? So now that Overton window has changed. And so I think the up and coming companies don't feel like they have a gun to their head the same way they did in, in the Zerp era when the big fang companies were kind of just basically funding this kind of luxury belief ecosystem in Silicon Valley. So that, that all changed. And so journalists have like the ability for a journalist to go cancel someone in the way they were doing in 2017 or 2018 just does not exist today, right? People reject the frame. They don't have as much influence on Twitter. The, the, you know, the, the upteenth cancellation just doesn't work as well as the first or the second or the third. And so look, I mean, um, uh, Carta is a great example of Twitter still has mobs and, and potential repercussions if, if you can really whip someone up over something. And that wasn't a, that wasn't, had nothing to do with wokeness. It had everything to do with, uh, you know, bad policy. And, and he ended, ultimately the CEO ended up kind of caving and, and, and making probably the right decision for that business just relative to their like core business versus this, this secondary business. But so to, to, to say that cancellations are over is no, Twitter, Twitter yeah. still has mob mentalities. Um, and obviously stuff that came out of 10.7 and, and then the Harvard uh, president, we've, we talked about this on the pod a couple of weeks ago, 
so, so Twitter is as effective as it ever has been, but the, the meta and, and what you can get canceled or pressured for is very different. Um, yeah. And so that, that prior era is just not here. It, it may come back and may come back in a different form. I'm actually pretty confident it will. But in terms of the kind of pendulum swinging, we are, are very much in the people can kind of talk about whatever they want. And I mean, we had Curtis Yarvin on our podcast. If, if we had tried to have Curtis Yarvin on our podcast three or four years ago, we would have just been canceled by association because his Wikipedia page says that someone claimed yeah. he was a Nazi at some point. Yeah. And I, I didn't get one negative comment or, or response. If anyone listening to this had a negative response to it, let us know because, uh, yeah, I'm just curious how far the Overton window is extended. Yeah. Put it, put it this way. He, he, we kind of had that whole Harvard board of overseers. And, and I think like in ref reflection is like, maybe that's, it's, it's in poor taste in some ways, but like at the same time, there is an irony in that sense that that, that is what they call it. And these are people who police words all the time. And I was like, okay, someone's going to say something about this. Not a single person. And so <laughs> if that's a temperature check for where we are in 2024, it, it, first, it, it's just saner. Like people understood the the context of that that humor and the joke, whether or not you think it's funny, you, you, you don't feel like it's fuel for cancellation. Whereas in 2019, especially pre-COVID, like that, that would have just been, you know, boom, X says this. And it's like, you're, you're now extreme right wing for hosting this person. Um, but yeah, like, look, I think Claudine Gay's resignation and, and this kind of pressure on the university system and the spotlight on the university system may may actually be a pretty significant thing because it if the universities are having to re reevaluate DEI and don't forget the the Supreme Court also did the affirmative action case that there have been other kind of things um we we may actually be in a world now where there are going to be companies that have these kind of DEI policies and yes they're technically illegal but you can always kind of find a back way to do it but but the the demands that every company publish a a kind of like show me how many people of every race and, and, you know, affiliation or whatever are at your company kind of like in the era of 2017, when you had all these like, you know, uh, demographic transparency reports coming from tech companies. I think people just don't care about that. Anymore. Um, at least in terms of the mainstream, I think that there are going to be activists who, who do care about it. And, and the reality is I actually think it's a good thing for the market, right? If that really ends up being a driver of differential shareholder returns, smart companies will do it. And if it doesn't, companies won't do it. And, and so the market will actually play this out. And so you can tell me all you want about some Harvard study that says diversity ends up driving better shareholder returns. Well, we're going to now actually have a much more market-based approach here because there are going to be a bunch of companies that just choose not to do this or, or significantly de-emphasize it, in, at least in tech, right? Like obviously there's plenty of other parts of the economy that never really ended up getting affected by this, this kind of very tech-oriented uh, wokeness. The um, although there are also many industries that that it did affect uh, be, beyond tech uh, tech as well, certainly like Fortune five five hundred at, at, at large. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Real quick, what's the easiest choice you can make? Taking the window instead of the middle seat, outsourcing business tasks that you absolutely hate. What about selling with Shopify? Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Whether you're selling security systems or marketing memory modules, Shopify helps you sell everywhere, from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. I've used it in the past at the companies I've founded, and when we launch merch here at Turpentine, Shopify will be our go-to. Shopify helps turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. And Shopify helps you sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. With Shopify Magic, whip up captivating content that converts from blog posts to product descriptions. Generate instant FAQ answers. Pick the perfect email send time, Plus, Shopify magic is free for every Shopify seller. Businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash moment of Zen. Go to shopify.com slash moment of Zen now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash moment of Zen. 
If you're a startup founder or executive running a growing business, you know that as you scale, your systems break down and the cracks start to show. If this resonates with you, there are three numbers you need to know. 36,000, 25, and one. 36,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlined accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind, so you get a customized solution for all your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash zen. That's netsuite.com slash zen to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash zen. In response to your earlier point around, so yet yeah, cancel culture, I agree. It's, it's, it's not over. It feels like the right just discovered it. And, and now both sides are using it as a, as a, as a tool. And I'm, I'm sympathetic with some people who say, Hey, you know, the, the right was against cancel culture. Now they're, they're deploying it. I, I think that's accurate. Um, but, but, whether but or not, on. Yeah. right was never against cancel culture. It's, it's, it's classic power, right? Like if, if yeah. it's happening to your enemies, you're in favor of it. Like people are not that principled most of the time. So if yes. it's being effectively used against people you don't like, at best, you kind of are like, okay, I'm, I'm just going to be passive here. Yeah. Hate, totally. hate to see it, but uh, if it's going to happen to someone I don't like, you know, not the worst thing in the world. But but yeah. but the reality is, is, it's just politics is is power, right? And and it's like you know, hurt your enemies, help your friends, and so that that is cancel culture. Yep, Chris um, Chris Rufo is is was perhaps one of the biggest practicers of it uh, in terms of what he did around sort of uh, critical race theory and in schools uh, and the activism he also did around sort of. Uh, sort of the sex education in, in schools, and then most recently, of course, with uh, with uh, Claudine Gay and what's happening at, at universities. But I, I think one of the other big stories that has led it really accelerated this vibe shift, I think, is Ten Seven and and sort of uh, anti semitism in in the U.S. because it al- it awoke certainly Jewish people to the who were previously often left or, or pretty pretty woke uh, pretty insensitive on a lot of these a lot of these issues um to uh the challenges of of those problems as it relates to as it relates to jews because jews are are white <laughs> um, or are seen as white in, in this country and in this country i haven't seen convincing evidence of uh, anti-semitism divorced from anti anti anti-whiteness at least that's at any any reasonable scale and you see well, the numbers I mean, if you're, like if you're truly a Nazi on the far, far right, like that, that is true anti-Semitism that has nothing yeah. to do with anti-whiteness. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it doesn't seem to be a massive, we don't seem to have a massive Nazi problem in the U S maybe in Europe or other, other places. Well, well, no, hold on. So the left would like to tell you that Elon Musk is a Nazi and that is actually <laughs> the real anti-Semitism, right? Like the ADL is not condemning nearly at the same rate, the pro pro Hamas protests yeah. as it is the, yeah. uh, uh yeah. You know, Elon Musk one tweet in context and it doesn't yes, matter exactly. if he goes to israel and israel like the you know the head of yeah. the, uh the, all the people in israel from the government side of things are like elon musk is not an anti-semite the woke get to decide who is an yeah. anti-semite right yeah, nazi is just person bad person person i don't like even yes, if that person, person i don't like who has against is, right-wing views even if they're jewish <laughs> like like curtis um uh, and and so the um where was it going with this so because it's anti-whiteness, people can now say, hey, you know, I'm BLM ca- or BLM Chicago came out in favor of like legit pro Hamas, <laughs> Ex- explicitly pro Hamas. And now they, they could say, hey, BLM is anti-Semitic and have some or these you know, some factions of BLM are anti-Semitic um, and they can at least have some credibility, uh, like a moral claim, whereas they couldn't before because they couldn't. You can't say anti-white, but you can't you, you, you can't complain about anti-white because that's not really a problem in this country or people don't see it as a problem in this country, whereas they do see anti-Semitism as a, as a problem. And so any ideology or group that is not sort of giving Jews their proper whatever de- political deference or whatever um, can now be critiqued as anti-Semitic. And, and so it's given a lot of Jews permission to, to be anti-woke. And Jews are really interesting because they're a tiny number in people but they have massive influence. Um, Richard Hania wrote this great post called "The Great Jewish Realignment," and he talked about how Jews are like at the uh, are like fifty percent of top political donors are Jews, ten uh, percent of billionaires, um, and so 
So wait, are you, are you are you saying that a small group of Jewish people <laughs> have a disproportionate influence on in control of society? I'm not I thought saying Kanye, I, I thought Kanye got canceled for that. No, I'm, I'm not I'm, saying control. I'm saying uh, I, I'm saying influence um, in a, in a positive way, in a good way, and it, and not and not a, not in a coordinated way, in a decentralized way. They just claimed out, you know, they they just out, outperform, and so they if if they see a, a sort of ideology or movement is anti-Semitic. Um, you know, they're going to have issue with it. And, and, you know, they're putting pressure on the universities now, but, but the, the other position is that, or the other challenge is that there's a rising percentage of, uh, sort of Palestinian sort of the, the Palestinian cause is, is, uh, generating increasing sympathy among younger people. Mo most younger people at universities are more pro-Palestinian, certainly than older generations. And so there's this massive disconnect between the dollars and the numbers. And that's why Judaism is kind of this or the Israel issue is this great wedge issue um, in the topic of, of, of wokeness that I think is only going to continue to escalate. And it's, I think it's no coincidence that even before 10-7, we'd been talking about Israel a lot. Um, sort of the infighting, even within Israel, around sort of a group that wants to be more, uh, you know, religiously Jewish, uh, wants to be more, you know, Israel's a place for Jews. Um, and then sort of this other, you know, more cosmopolitan class that just wants Israel to be, you know, New York with some Judaism or, Lund or you know, whatever, some great city with, with some Judaism, but, you know, wants to have feminism and wants to have other sort of, you know, modern um, sort of, uh, you know, ways of living. And so I, I think unless the war, you know, uh, changes in some material way, I think that's going to continue to be the great wedge issue that uh that sort of people pushing back against wokeness continue to use because it's it's the only moral claim that that is acceptable in society and i think that that claim is also going to get people increasingly frustrated about hey you're, you're using anti-semitism as a cudgel to get everything that you want you you, you can't do that so i i expect this conflict to only uh only continue to escalate well i, I think one thing to think about is if, if you think about like the kind of wedge issues that have happened over the last you know 10 years uh, um you had Me Too, <clears throat> Trump, and then I think BLM, like George Floyd. And in each case, if, if you just kind of take someone who's kind of like a centrist or PMC or and, and they kind of need, they need guidance for like, how, how should I be on this issue? Usually with these issues, this thing comes down and you either can kind of support the, the oppressed, right? And, and be kind of like a good, modern, uh, enlightened, educated person, which means liberal, and, and you kind of like move, move left, right? So you, you, you kind of say, okay, I'm not going to be in the, in the camp that's reactionary to that. <coughs> but you have 10-7 happen. And after multiple kind of issues like this, um, and then COVID even, right? So it's like generally, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to follow in line with the, the government here, belief science, all that kind of stuff. And then 10-7 happens. And, and if you're a Jewish person and you, and you have that you know, it's part of your identity and, and you kind of see the, the horror of this through the lens of, you know, your, your cultural faith, whatever, however you want to des describe it. And then you're like, okay, well, clearly this should be in the camp that good people, like we all, we all agreed that, you know, with Trump, with Me Too, with BLM and, and COVID, we, this is, the, this is the right position. And to see so many of the people that they previously were kind of following go into the, what they believe to be the wrong camp. I think that's it's kind of the first major wedge issue on the left we've seen uh, in the last few years. I, and I would leave it to the commenters to kind of like bring up other ones. But from from my perspective, most of the kind of like wedge issues tend to be pretty easy to understand. It's like okay, all all good people go to go to this, right? Like abortion comes back up. Oh, well, clearly, uh, you know that's that's pro women. Like the most people are going to kind of be in the pro. Abortion camp. I mean, look at look at how the voters have been treated, right? You have all these conservative states. It goes uh, to the they're kind of like voting for constitutional amendment in most states, and and most of them have clicked towards no, actually, abortion's right. It's twenty twenty four, and even if we are more conservative and we're going to vote, you know, Republican for the presidential election, like we actually think at, at this point, this is a this is a this is a culture war issue from the past that somehow Republicans think they're going to win on. But I think with ten seven, it's the first kind of like major issue in the last few years where really it, it kind of landed and then the left split and, and, and not a huge chunk, I think, but, but I think that there are a lot of call it Clinton Democrats or Biden Democrats, not, not the extreme left who look at this and, and, and you, I mean, you see it through how both 
Biden and even the Clintons have responded in terms of like, no, we're pro-Israel here. And so that that split on the Democratic side on, on an issue hasn't really happened um, in, in kind of like the, the modern meta, where I think that the other thing to think about is just the, the, the importance of social media in 2024 relative to where it was in, you know, 2012 or 2014. So, so the, the 10 years of, of social media. So now you really have all of this battling out every day in, in the kind of intellectual arena um, through memes, through dunks, through, you know, links pasted in group chats. And, and so I, I, I think that that 10-7 is the first. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if you do have, you know, a couple more of those pop up. And I mean, yeah. it's sort of bubbling up right now with this, like, should Biden be the nominee? Um, and I think what's fascinating is you have like the extreme left is just like, he's been a failure from, you know, all the policies that we wanted. It's like pack the court, add all, all, all the things that they wanted to go do. Right. And then I think even from the, the more kind of like, you know, centrist Democrats, they're kind of like, oh man, I think he's probably going to lose to, to Trump. And so that could end up being a, again a big wedge issue, but but you know as much as I would imagine that I, I th- kind of thought the same thing last time during the 2020 primary, you know, with Bernie Sanders and Biden, and I think people hated Trump enough to like kind of rally behind Biden, but you know the, we'll, we'll see how it plays out this time because Biden in 2024 is a very different you know in terms of his mental capacities, and I mean. I, I actually don't know if he will debate. He may just kind of take a, if they're smart, they basically say, hey, you know, Trump didn't debate in the primaries and I don't want to debate Trump. I don't, I don't, you know, think he's, you know, you come up with some reasons and you just debate, don't do it because yeah. a, a debate between Biden in his current form and Trump, I, I mean, I, I could kind of be like a Nixon on TV moment with Kennedy, like it, to an extreme, like in terms of like people really see that his mental capacities are just not there. Um, but yeah, yeah, Vivek versus Kamala. I mean, come on. I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just going to take my victory lap. You know, yeah. Tell the comment. I, I kind of nailed the prediction there, and and I mean, like he just he trounced everybody, and then everyone was kind of like, you know, you've got. Um, I like Keith, but like Keith saying that that Haley is going to win in New Hampshire. I mean, it doesn't seem like it. Look at the prediction. It's actually one interesting thing, and this has been an intellectual interest of mine for a long time, is prediction markets seem to actually starting to get decent volume on crypto. And, and the important thing about volume here in terms of just like total dollars at stake, it means is like if you, if you actually have a better model for the world, you, you can make real money. And we're talking like, you know, overall, like a million dollars into some of these prediction markets around the elections. And, and what's interesting is it's not just one. So it's not just like, who's going to win the Iowa primary? Fine. That, that's easy to bet for Trump. And, and there's not a ton of return. But there are decent, uh, decently liquid pools around like who's going to be in second place for Iowa, right? So it's like you're kind of playing a little bit into this kind of culture that is now you know, much bigger on sports gambling because it's legal in terms of like more people being able to participate in it. And, and Kalshi is a company, it's backed by Sequoia, that actually has licenses from the CFTC. He's not allowed to do prediction markets for politics because the politicians don't want these things to happen, yeah. but, but is actually expanding the number of things that you can bet on from a kind of like futures contract standpoint. So like uh, interest rates and all this other kind of stuff. Entertainment, I think, is a category they can do. But um, the, 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 the fact that this is actually coming into prominence, Trump has been tweeting out uh, screenshots to his poly market as a kind of like in, in, in lieu of polls. And um, Joe's Weisenthal actually recently just tweeted a poly market. So I'm not an investor in poly market. Uh, I know the founder and, and I've known him for a while. Uh, this is another attempt on a, a prediction market. There was a project on Ethereum called Augur. And, and um, there have been a couple of companies that have tried to work there. But like, I'm actually optimistic that it could hit an inflection point this year. And, and now anything significant that we're talking about, rather than having to listen to pundits, you can just look at the market. And that, that's moving in real time with new information. Um, and I, I really think that a smart news site will start actually putting inline odds on any of the claims that they're making, assuming yeah. that there's a market, right? Like I, I would read a news site that like was pulling in from the most liquid pools of prediction markets. And that actually has a reflexive benefit that the more people talk about them, the more people are going to want to bet. Now, yeah. there, there are some legality things. One, 
and to, for the record, I've never actually participated in it. I, I don't want the legal headache. You can't do it as an American. But I mean, there are decent kind of workarounds because all this stuff is on chain. So you, you, you don't necessarily need to use a website. You could just interact with those contracts directly. But um, so anyways, going back to the prediction market, I think Trump is, and for New Hampshire, it was kind of before it was 70, 30 and Haley was rising. And after the, the trouncing in Iowa, he's up to 93%. So. But yeah, I, I, I uh, was with uh, Adam D'Angelo yesterday, who I consider to be very smart. And anytime we were talking about predictions in the future, whether it was about topics of you know the election or things like Taiwan, he would always quote the the prediction markets. Um, so he, he is very in tune um, with sort of the what, what's what's happening in prediction markets. And and I I feel like Patrick Carlson is too. Like I, I think I think very smart people really trust uh, you know sort of the wisdom of the crowds on, on these markets. Well, so, so there's an interesting history here. So um, Robin Hansen um, yes. from the Mercatus Center, Tyler Cohen at George Mason, actually published, um, I'm not going to get 100% right here, but basically came up with a model for creating uh, a, an automated market maker effectively. Uh, and and they, he had a different term for it. But automated market makers underpin all of, of DeFi from a swap standpoint. Point. So Uniswap, the largest decentralized exchange on, on kind of the Ethereum universe, there's, a, there's an AMM, automated market maker on Solana. But the idea is that that is actually a big breakthrough because there's a special formula that you, you have in terms of uh, you can put any two assets in and then it auto balances in terms of the price uh, for whatever the market thinks that the, the equivalent. So if you put in USDC, which is the equivalent of a dollar in Ethereum, the market can quickly go actually do price discovery for you and, and actually compared to something like Coinbase, which uses something called the central limit order. Outside the scope of this, but the original kind of concept for this that got popularized that Vitalik Buterin posted on, a, on Reddit, which then ended up turning into Uniswap, was from Robin Hansen, and it was specifically geared toward prediction markets. And so um, that is actually, I think, an interesting thing is that a lot of the kind of core underpinning of how DeFi works from a kind of like the trading component is, is rooted in, in some academic research around prediction markets. And so I think generally people who find, you know, Tyler Cowen and Robin Hansen and, and, and some of those, those folks at Mercatus interesting have always kind of thought prediction markets. Um, it, it was the thing that got me interested in crypto is someone wrote a paper, I think it was Jerry Brito, who's now at um, uh, Coin Center. He, he wrote something in like 2013 or 2014 about Bitcoin use in, in prediction markets. And, and I, I, that I was hooked. I was like, oh, someone could go build this. I got really interested in Augur. Um, didn't end up working out there for a variety of reasons. But I, I do think like whether it's Polymarket or one of these other, other um, you know, kind of on-chain markets, I think the biggest thing is just actually great gaining cultural relevancy, which then creates a shelling point and reflexivity for those markets. Because now the, the, the biggest issue before is that when they're sitting off to the side in low liquidity, you you don't um, have you you need retail right. So the problem is, is the sophisticated investors need need the minnows to actually make the market. And then the more money that goes into it, then you have more sophisticated investors fighting against each other while trying to compete for that that retail flow. But I think it, it may be this year that because of the election um, and that just crypto infrastructure is better, like we actually do get you know I, I like to see that the like um, who's going to win the presidency you know, in November to see that market cross something like 10 million or, or hundred million, I, I wouldn't be surprised, uh, especially if you kind of get some interest rate cuts and, and maybe a bump in crypto is generally what happens when you have these crypto cycles uh, around the Bitcoin halving, which is a cut in monetary policy for Bitcoin, which is going to happen this year, is there's some ri even more risky asset within crypto that a bunch of people want to go take their gains and, and go play with. NFTs is a good example, ICOs in the previous cycle. So maybe there's a version where prediction markets is actually the kind of uh, trendy thing. Yeah, uh, fa fascinating. Um, closing the loop a, a little bit and tying these threads together, the you mentioned Coinbase earlier. I mean, just a testament to, uh, or Brian Armstrong's courage in 2020, just a testament to how far things have accelerated. And by things, I mean sort of this, this reaction to the sort of extremism on one side in the 2010s. There was a sort of this, this vibe shift or, or this reaction. And to illustrate how much it's accelerated from 2020 to 2023, Brian Armstrong in 2020, when he made that that post, what he really said was, hey, we're not talking about politics anymore in the office. He didn't even express like a political opinion, really. He just said, we're not talking about politics. We're just going to focus on crypto. 
or, or sort of regulation or politics that affects crypto. Which, yeah, by the way, um, you know, people think they've got a gotcha of like, oh, you said you're not going to talk about politics. And it's like clear in the post, the only politics that I care about are the ones that further our mission, which is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and he got destroyed for, for that. And it's like he, he was you know on an island. Because um, you know, it was company. right coded. It basically said that you are saying that 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 by not being political. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be, be, um, and so but he didn't express sort of something extremely controversial in that piece. Um, you know, relative to today, a lot of companies are doing that. But m recently, in sort of in light of uh, sort of affirmative action, in light of, uh, you know, the changes there, but also the changes as it relates to or sort of the controversy around Harvard, he tweeted out something like, hey, you know, DEI is not only, I don't know, uh, you know, challenging for a bunch of reasons. He said it's illegal. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's, it's an anti-DEI post. If he did that in 2020, he would have been excoriated. You know, there's no, no one who, who would have publicly said that. But Today, well, I think you know, part of that's the Supreme Court case, right? So the yeah, Supreme yeah, Court right. cases, even though it was always illegal, right? Yeah. Um, the Supreme <laughs> Court reaffirmed that yes, actually, the Civil Rights Act and and the Constitution do not allow you to discriminate based on race. Yeah. Uh, even if that means helping other people. Yep. Yep. The well, ap yeah, and after Elon said it, and a number of other people, so, you know, Bill Ackman seems to have just discovered it, and but then also is is saying, hey, this this is this is this is not okay. Um, and it's interesting, you know, Richard Anya wrote a, a, a post that I, I, that I agree with, which is, he says, um, some people take the wrong lessons of, of why it's, it's, uh, not ideal. The, what's, what's not ideal about DEI is that it's anti-market or, or it messes with, 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 with the market. And so you have some people who are trying to, um, have counter initiatives like, you know, creating unions that, that protect cer certain classes being discriminated against, um, you know, adding other groups to the progressive stack, like there's this, you know, do you add Jews to the DEI stack? Um, and that is just, it's like fighting one anti-market measure with another anti-market measure. Um, and that um, I'm less of a fan of than, hey, just let the, let the market, you know, function. To your point earlier, if, if it does lead to better outcomes, th that will be reflected in, in, in the market. And that's great. Let companies operate how they want to operate. But um yeah, so I just wanted to make that uh, that additional point. But I mean, there's so much fraud in that, and then the claims that they make. So you know, like, oh, like if you're from an impressed group, you have a harder time raising money. And and um, Sam Altman is rumored to be raising something like eight to ten billion dollars from the Middle East, where being gay is illegal. Okay, so so like, I I think people want to believe a narrative that that's like oh well if we just put these policies in place then everyone would be competing and it's it's just, it's it's there's some systemic reason that x group or y group is not doing as well and and are there historical reasons that that can contribute to where people are starting from today yes but as it relates to like modern 2024 if you have a really good idea to think that, oh, well, people are going to like make discriminate you based on no, if anything, that you're going to get like a bump in terms of even if they don't have an explicit policy, they'd say, wait, like, A, the idea is good. And B, like you're from an underrepresented background. That's that's a huge one. And so even if you don't have that, I, I, I think I think it's just all cope. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll get excruciated for this because I think people people don't like the harsh reality of just like, no, if like you actually have a good idea and good execution on something, um, you you will get funded and the market will, will take care of it. And I think where people want to kind of make it is like, oh, well, people are, these other people have advantages. Great. They have, a, they have an advantage at the starting line, uh, but that's just life. And, and so you can, either, you can either basically say, we need to remove that, which is basically communism. It's like, we're going we're gonna to try to strip away all the advantages from other people. Versus saying like, hey, what can we be doing as a society to like kind of equal the playing field or, or the starting line a little bit more earlier in life? And what the people want to do is later in life, they, they want to try to make up for the fact that, you know, by the time you're 25, you've had 25 years of experience, education, whatever your family situation is. Th th those are the things that actually, if, if you want to go make a difference, you have to start really early. But that's obviously very hard. And so instead, people people want to feel good about trying to to do it later, which it just doesn't work. Can can Agreed. I go back to the all in the all in thing? Sure. Sure. So I mean, I think my sense is I've been listening to the podcast on and off for the last few years. Um, 
overall, I think it's a very high quality podcast. I think it's interesting because it's kind of the first podcast to take people who actually know what's going on in tech. And, and the week, uh, the example this week is some reporter for the information who's ostensibly supposed to understand tech wrote an article about Flexport raising a $260 million round from Shopify on an uncapped note. So very good terms for a very late stage company and called it struggling. As in, uh, in, in a non-zero interest rate environment, okay, that a, a startup is able to go raise a quarter of a billion dollars and, and you, you describe it as struggling. It's just, it's just so not tied to reality. And so I think going back to why All In appeals to people is these are practitioners. Do they have flaws? Are they cringe in certain ways? Sure. But the idea is, is you know, Chamath's got a bunch of money at stake and a lot of different things. Friedberg does. So does, so does Sachs. Jay Cowell a little less. Um, but I think that the, the thing that, that's interesting about that, that political dynamic is, so you had Friedberg is kind of always this libertarian out there, you know, whatever set of opinions. Sachs is, is pretty much, I would say, anti-establishment Republican that's trying to be non-MAGA, but like would still side with Trump over any of the wokeness. And then you had Chamath, who was a big donor, and, and he admitted this in, in 2020 to Biden and, and Democrats. And then Jake Al, who's just kind of like your, your typical you know, Trump derangement syndrome person. And I think what you've seen is the change there is the fact that Biden is clearly doesn't have the mental capacities. Um, and, and anyone who's from, you know, norms like, oh, the adults are back in the room, like all that's out the window, it's complete farce. And so I think that they're coming to terms with that. And I think Chamath is realizing that like being a good kind of lib and, and kind of playing into that is basically those people still hate him. And so in some ways, he's going to actually be a much more effective kind of independent pool of capital if he's kind of floating between, you know, potential anti-Trump or, you know, alternatives to Trump like Vivek or RFK Jr. And I think J. Cal is, is kind of clicked in one notch, right? Like J. Cal is doing this like Dean Phillips thing. But I think that they're realizing it's like, wow, actually, our podcast is a big platform and we can actually help boost potentially other candidates. At least that's what they think. Whereas if, if we just kind of keep voting for, for whatever the, the, the Democratic machine wants, A, actually, the policies are, are, are really bad. And then B, like it's just increasingly comical in terms of, um, you know, like how, how ineffective the, the, the sitting president is when that's actually what you were claiming that you were removing Trump. And then in, with distance, Trump's, and we've talked about this, Trump's policies put away to the side his, his, his demeanor and, and how he delivers stuff. I mean, Jamie Dimon basically said that this week. And Jamie Dimon is as, as establishment, you know, uh, globally lead as it gets. And so for him to kind of be like, Trump's policies are actually in time have, have looked better and better. Um, and I, and I think that the, the, the thing going back to the social media thing is, you know, when Obama was in office, social media was just so much less relevant in terms of driving the discourse. But to see people crossing the border in Arizona and then being able to just like interview them and then immediately have that go to TikTok and Twitter, it, you can't sweep that under the rug, right? Like the media deciding not to cover it, the New York Times not featuring it as a front page story every day, it doesn't matter because it turns into the front page story on Twitter. And just so happens now the owner of Twitter, so you can kind of think of it as like the biggest newspaper in the world, anytime he retweets or engages with the thing, it's, it's basically an A1 story on this network. And so I think that they have a much harder time with the narrative that they had constructed before because the media tended to be so much softer on, on how a democratic presidential administration, the flaws of it weren't getting covered the same way. And, and now that's been laid bare because the power of social media and, and, and Twitter specifically. So even if the journals aren't on Twitter, the fact is the audience size is on Twitter. Um, and I think even the Tucker thing, and, and we'll see how Tucker ends up playing out. I'm, I'm still a little skeptical that he's not going to end up on some you know, cable news network. But the fact that Tucker, the, you know, the, the most influential TV uh, kind of commentator, on politics is now not at Fox News and instead going direct on Twitter is, I think, very much a sign of times. And actually, it's a theme at the beginning of 2023, when we started this podcast, we talked a lot about Substack and being upstream. And, and I think the reality is, is like, 
especially in a world where Elon pushes video more and more on Twitter, I think Twitter will be the the kind of place that everything gets fought out on uh, in terms of the all the issues and ideas as it was before. But in a world where it's a little bit more even playing field, because before it was heavily weighted towards the blue checks and, and the left. Yeah. And it's, just, it's, it's crazy how much it shifted. I mean, like, I haven't heard of Taylor Lorenz in a long time. Uh, you know, and there were like a dozen other people who were so vocal, um, you know, canceling often, um, you know, shunning voices, like, you know, quote, unquote, I would say holding accountable. It's kind of like the Chris Rufo of the left, but I just don't see it anymore. Um, well, and they're well, on the Switcher, great example, right? Quits Twitter or not using it. Open AI saga happens. Which, where is she sharing her big updates on Twitter? Right. Yeah. yeah. Re- uh, reveal preference. Yeah. It's, um, and to me, the big question is, this is a question of 2024 as it relates to this topic is, will Trump change that acceleration or change that reaction? Because if Trump wins, do we go back to w- the way things were? Um, or, or even does it just, you know, stay neutral? It, it's just things are accelerating a, lo- a lot now uh, on the reverse. And, and we'll see how, how, how long that how long that lasts. Well, so, so I think to, let's play the scenario where Trump wins. Maybe we should actually start. Do we think Trump's going to win? Do you think Trump's going to win? If, I, if you put a gun to my head right now, I, I would say, yes, I, I do think he's going to win. But it's slightly above 50-50. Like, you know, it, it's, it's not a obvious. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's a coin flip. Trump probably favored right now. But I mean, there's just so much that can happen. Yeah. And I think with these legal cases, um, I think generally they're net positive for him in terms of winning because I think he looks like a victim. But like, we'll, we'll kind of see how they all play out. Um, I'm skeptical that the Democrats will replace Biden. But that could be a kind of wild card thing. Um, and I don't really think Gavin Newsom is going to beat Trump, but maybe. Um, but so so let, let's just take the assumption that Trump does win. My sense is that they're going to try to. Uh, so so let's take it from the different perspective. So from the media's perspective, it's like a stimulus, right? It's like, oh, snap, like, you know, New York Times numbers are going back up. CNN numbers are going back up. And I, and I think that some of that will happen for sure. But I, I think um, there, there's a novelty in the resistance in 2016. I don't think it's the same in 20. I think people are going to be tired, right? They had Trump already. They put a ton of energy in getting rid of him. They thought he was going away. They impeached him twice. Now they had four court cases. And if he ends up winning, like, I think people are just going to feel really defeated. Plus COVID, right? Like people, people are just like, I mean, just think of anything pre-COVID. It just feels like a decade ago. Um, and I guess at this point, you know, we're four years, five years. So it's like, you know, half a decade. But I think the uh, the the challenge will be, one, there's also nothing you can do to um, really affect Trump because he can't run again. Now, crazy TDS people think, well, he, you know, oh, he'll try to make himself, you know, king for life and, and not give up power reality. But I think if he wins, he's going to have a, a, it'll be kind of, some amount of a red wave. I don't think you'll get split ticket. That seems seems um, unlikely. So if they do flip the Senate um, and they have the House, he's going to have two years to kind of do a couple policy things. He had that last time, by the way, and he was able to get one thing done, the tax bill. He, he wasn't able to repeal Obamacare or things like that. So I think it's like it's going to be two years of a potential legislative stuff. He might get another Supreme Court justice, which would be a, a big thing for the right. But other than that, he's going to do a bunch of executive orders. People are going to fight. And then the the Democrats will surely, like, you know, win the House back or or the Senate in the midterms. And then for the last two years, it'll just be basically him fighting with people on Twitter like he did the last time. Um, and so I, I think my sense is that it just won't have the same effectiveness. And I also think that the version of the world where interest rates are higher, people are a little bit more concerned about like keeping their job, like, you know, like the luxury belief stuff kind of goes out the window. And so I'm, I think it'll just be like a a notch or two down, but maybe I'm completely wrong. And instead it dials up because it's just like a reaction to the reaction. Um, But if if you were to ask me, I I think it's actually going to be less bad than people thought it was before because people also know like they they like before it was this oh my goodness 
and uh, surprise attack. What, what is going to happen? Like, you know, he, he, he's running like we, and we had this, this belief, I think that a lot of people at least had is that there was a level of competence that happened at, at the presidency, you know, ignoring George Bush Jr. or, you know, George W. And like, just to think he like, okay, he, um, you know, I don't think he was that competent. Maybe Dick Cheney was running the White House. But like, I think what happened was Trump ran, you know, one, and then for four years, kind of nothing really happened. If you actually look at it with some distance, you know, there were some policies that changed, but for the most part, it, was, it wasn't the end of democracy as much as people want to make January 6th. And then we got Biden and it was like, okay, there's literally like no one home there. The guy's like kind of like walking around the White House, uh, rumors that he's like, you know, potentially soiling himself and they're like, high. like, it's just like, and, and, and so it, it's crazy to think that people were being like, oh, we really need the adults back in the room. And then you have a senile and it's really sad. Like the guy should have wrote off as being VP, um, you know, maybe a little handsy with, with some of the people over the course of his career, but for the most part. And instead, I think now people are just going to look back at Biden as just like, okay, that, that was, it was even worse than Jimmy Carter. Um, yeah. And so I, I think like both, both Trump and Biden have, have shown that it kind of doesn't matter who's in the White House. And, and I think if anything, it's shown Curtis is kind of right in that it, it, there is an established oligarchy within this bureaucratic system that is Washington that kind of runs things. Yeah. Um, you know. No matter what happens, we're going to get a handsy octogenarian uh, pr- pr- president. Um, there you go. Right? Who is more handsy, Biden or Trump? <laughs> the um, at least at least Trump yeah. is funny, right? Like you know, right? Well, I think Biden. I mean, you can't even too. you couldn't even admit that Trump is funny, right? Because he, all the right. all the terrible things that he said. But the reality is, like, even even some of these like kind of like more lib Hollywood funny accounts will actually tweet you know a video of Trump and be like, he is actually kind of funny. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, and, and, I, I, I think it'll be it'll be like people think it'll be the, the kind of end of the world. And the reality is, it's actually it's like everyone kind of knows exactly how this is going to play out. Yeah, I think Biden is funny in his own way, um, but uh, or sort of like the gaffes are funny or when he falls asleep or whatever. But I, I think the um, I do agree. It's a little bit like the boy who cried wolf, too, in the sense that, you know, people made such a big deal of the Russia thing of the, um, you know, uh, Cambridge Analytica thing. I mean, there's just so many issues that people have, you know, claimed were these great, uh, you know, sort of infractions that in fact weren't. And so it's hard, even if there is a real problem, it's just hard for, you know, half the country to take it seriously after the other half has just cried wolf so many times. So, Right. I, I think the boy cried wolf is a great way to frame it is I think people just get tired, right? Like the first time, I, I, even I was just like, oh my gosh. And, and, totally. and I was definitely in more of my kind of like, apolitical, just don't rock the boat, like focus on, on Coinbase, yeah. not thinking about the politics side of things as much. And I remember when Trump got elected, I was like, dude, I, I literally oh. shed a tear. I was like, oh my God, is this the end? I, I, this is sort right. of my, and now, uh, now it's just like, who cares? would I prefer someone different? <laughs> sure. But like, if he gets elected, is he actually going to make a difference? No, he's going to piss off a bunch of people who otherwise like, you know, I, I think probably I would say that their policies are, are really terrible. The, the kind of like central uh, centralist type person who doesn't like them. Okay. But, but I, I just, I think people like way over rotate uh, yeah. on, on this stuff. And, and yeah, and I think the reality is like, do, do we, should we have a, a, like a completely open border like we do right now? Right. Or, or, or close it. Yeah. And how he delivered that line. Yes. Not tasteful. But the point, should we have a closed border? Should it, should it be completely walled off? And should we have Anderol and the, the latest technology preventing just like completely, you know, if we talk about unfettered, unfettered, you know, migration across the border, like, yeah, like, l- let, let's have an orderly process for bringing people into the country. We need immigrants. Like, we, we have massive amount of job vacancies and, and we don't have a great replacement rate. So, yes, this country will be better beneficial on Im- Im- with immigration, but we should have an orderly process and we should significantly increase educated immigration. Right. So. Um, yeah. But yeah. The, the analogy I, I thought that was helpful that uh, Curtis or someone else made is this idea of, let's say you were about to be the new CEO of Coinbase or Twitter as, as Elon did, you could come in and fire 80% of the org as, as Elon did. You can fire whoever, whoever you want. You're the CEO. You, you have power. 
if you come in as president and CEO of the government, you can't do that. You, you can't fire most people. You, you just don't have that, that power. And so imagine you come into an organization where 90 plus percent of the people you can't fire and they hate you. They don't want to work for you. Uh, they just want to keep their jobs, but, but not make any progress. Nothing's going to happen. And so if you're, if you're worried about sort of some sort of takeover, some sort of, you know, b- bad things happening, you're, you're in luck because there's a gridlock effectively. If you're worried about the government being able to be, you know, to do things or functional, then, then you should be worried because there's gridlock, but there's gridlock either way in some sense, because yeah, these are bureaucratic organizations that can't really do much. Here, 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 let me let me try to take the other side. So, what, why is Trump uh, a danger to to democracy or or kind of all the things? So, one, he he accelerates. I think the 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 populist game. Like, so you know, get to an environment in twenty twenty eight. If you don't believe Trump was going to try to make himself dictator for life, twenty twenty eight comes along. Hell, he could lose and then run again. They're like maybe, but um, so. I think 2028 comes along, you have, you have two fresh faces. I think th- the most likely is you're going to get populists on both sides are going to be the ones that, so there's going to be some heir apparent from the Trump MAGA side of things. And I actually think you'll, you'll attack more populist on the left. And, and as much as the democratic machine and, you know, the super, super delegates and all the things that the Democrats actually do to just not allow like the extreme side of the party to take over, I think it'll have a bigger populist push. And, and so you could see an AOC versus running against, you know, Vivek or some 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 other person, and so I think you could argue that okay, Trump is accelerating that. But like, if you actually ask, remove Trump from the situation, uh, he goes to jail. He can't he can't run. Um, you, do you really think populism is going away? Like the Mille speech? Like no, it's 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 the trend. It's, it, there's a group of people in the country. Uh, mostly on the on the right, but I think that there are plenty of people on the left who feel like they've been left behind by the kind of globalized elite that came out of the post Cold War era, right? So shareholder value got a lot of benefit, but like the the, the factory in my local town is, is shutting down, and my Elks Lodge doesn't have any members, and there's fentanyl in my town, or or an inner city thing where it's you know the the you know, major American cities are, are littered with addicts. And, and, you know, it's like Philadelphia is like trank. Have you seen any of these videos? It's just like, oh, and, and it's just like, okay, so who's, who, what are the policies to actually prevent this? And, and, and so you have people on both sides of the, the kind of country who, by the way, are at the lowest end of, of the kind of economic rung, who represent most of the voters. And I think the Democrats have this belief that, oh, Poor people should vote for Democrats because we take care of them. And I think that it's fundamentally flawed for two reasons. One, the identity politics component of the Democratic platform basically wakes up every day from culture and politics and tells anyone who has white skin, you have privilege and you are racist and you need to be doing better. When if you feel like you've been left behind, you're like, wait a second. I don't have any privilege and like what what like what, how am I getting any benefit and why why does some you know person with a different skin tone who just showed up to this country have some program or or some benefit designed for them when the reality is like I'm also struggling. And so Democrats completely alienate that that part of the population and it turns out like there are a lot of people in this country who are like that as much as we do have people coming from an immigration standpoint. And I think the second thing with Democrats that, and this is a little less, I think, relevant. I think that first point is actually the most relevant. If Democrats got rid of the identity politics component of their platform, I think they would have a lot more people click over. But the second part is, and it's a, it's a nuanced thing, is poor Americans or, or kind of Americans who are kind of on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum, they still have a belief in the American dream, whether or not it's true, that's a different discussion. And they think that at some point in their life, if they just kind of get the right set of circumstances, they're going to be back on top or they're going to be doing really well. And I don't think that that exists nearly at the same rate uh, in, in other kind of Western countries. I think most people in Western countries kind of know where their station is in life and they, they kind of are there. Whereas I think in, in the US, there's still a large segment of the population that is on you know, the lower side economically, but believe that they can still achieve. And so the Democrats kind of basically selling you on this, this like billionaires and whatever, 
no, like there's a whole segment of, of, of kind of poor people in this country. They look at billionaires and say, oh, I want to be a billionaire or I want to be a millionaire. And I, I if I just kind of get this and this done, I'm going to I'm going to be able to get that nice car, that nice house. Nice. And that, that's consumerism. That is that is American capitalism. And those extreme outcomes, obviously, you know, Antonio loves to talk about this, but like those are the two parts of the Democratic platform. And then we've talked about it before. It's like housing, education. I think that ties up into both of those things. But that is where they, they've lost all of these kind of like working class whites. And, and they don't, even union members are moving more to the Republican side of things because no one wants to wake up and be told, oh, sorry, because of the color of your skin, regardless of how you're doing in life, you have privilege, you are racist, you need to do better. Uh, in terms of, it's like, no, I'm a good person. And like, I actually am just trying to take care of my family. Like, I, I don't want to be lectured. I don't want to be lectured by Hollywood. I don't want to be lectured by, by, you know, the Democratic platform. And so it's, it's actually ironic because I think Joe Biden in a world where he had more, you know, going on right now is actually is like the perfect kind of candidate for that because he is a little bit more of that kind of blue collar union guy would have a beer with. Um, and, and so I, I think it's it's unfortunate for the Democrats in the sense that they, they just it, the attacking to the extreme left that is very focused on identity politics, I think is just a fundamentally losing position. And the only reason they are are even relevant is because the, the guy on the right is just so polarizing, even for people on the right, that if you got a little bit more of an established, if you like click one dial professional or, or kind of like establishment, but populist, so a Vivek or DeSantis or and obviously they both kind of floundered in their campaign. But like you put one of those people in, I think that the Republicans are, are going to, from at least a presidential politics with the electoral college, are going to be much more competitive. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think a smart AOC knows that she can actually win on a populist thing, but she's got to lose a little bit of the identity politics and a little bit more of like, you, you deserve your fair share. And I think that version of AOC just like rides a huge wave, like Obama level, like into the yeah. office in, into the Oval Office. Well, it's um, a few a few comments. You, you mentioned no one wants to be told that because of the color of your skin, you have privilege and you need to do better. It turns out some college educated whites do, do want to be told that. You know, I, I think they were the biggest supporters of BLM, even more than than, than black people, a certain segment of white people. But I do agree that working class whites don't want to be told that. And I don't even think working class minorities uh, appreciate it. My understanding of, of sort of working class white or minorities is that they are socially conservative, basically, um, uh, or, or more, or certainly anti identity politics. Um, and my, here's where the rub is. My understanding is that they're also economically conservative a, a, a little bit. Um, uh, sorry, sorry, ec uh, economically liberal or somewhere in between where they like free shit too, right? Like under Trump, the budget was, uh, you know, it, it continued to, you know, the deficits continued to expand, you know, uh, the UBI of, of COVID or whatever. Like Steve Bannon is not a free market person. And this is where there's a little bit of difference between Malay and, uh, you know, Malay's populism because in Argentina, like 50% of the country, I, I believe, is on welfare of some form, and the other 50%, you know, is, is paying for it. And so uh, Malay is um, on the side of, he's, he's a populist, like globally, because he doesn't accept sort of this, uh, he's libertarian, basically, and he doesn't accept the sort of, you know, one, um, you know, one world state that of the, you know, Davos sort of that is, that is trying to, you know, one world government, etc. the sort of overbearing, you know, government taking over all parts of life. Um, but that also means he's not um, he's not giving more money to poor people. <laughs> um, whereas I do believe that working class whites um, have somewhat uh, economically liberal liberal views too, in the sense that they like um, you know they like more money given to them from from the government. And so that I that's mean that's why they good. didn't get rid of Obamacare and and long term disability rates. Like look at the map of that. It's like it's disproportionately in the south, and so it's like white people are the ones actually using that. Yeah. But but the key thing is, is on on how politics work is it's, it's it's how people feel when they hear that message, and so the Republicans are very good about not making people feel bad about that, yeah. and instead kind of selling them on some vision where they're going to be a better version of themselves in, in the whatever position they are, and don't make them feel about the, bad about the long term disability. Focus in on the culture war issues, right? Which yeah. which easy to get you riled up or the border, right? So play into xenophobia, but but. The reality is that the, the white working class people, 
use a ton of benefits. And, and so that's where I think a smart Democrat can actually shift the platform slightly. And, and you just de-emphasize the identity politics part and emphasize right. the kind of like, I can get you more free stuff. That's yeah. the dangerous thing. Yeah. And, and in terms yeah. of, from my standpoint, because that's a never ending cycle is if you just keep doing that. But that's the winning strategy is you need to bring more people under the umbrella of saying, I'm going to help you do better in life. Yeah. Um, more, more, more stuff for you. And, and we don't totally. need to lecture you on identity stuff. And, and, and yeah, it, it feels like the, yeah, the winning party will assemble the multiracial working class. And if the right is able to get minorities in the way that it's increasingly been able to get more, you know, Latino people, more Hispanics, um, then that will be a winning strategy for them. And if the Democrats are able to de-emphasize some of the more extreme identitarian stuff or some of the trans stuff um, and focus on the economics, which is where, where a lot of the working class sympathizes with them, then, uh, then maybe they'll be able to assemble the, the multiracial working class and include whites. Um, in- Such a small percentage of the people vote on those culture war issues. And they're going to vote on those. The, the, like if, you, if your culture war issue is your number one issue, you're already going to be voting for that party even if that issue yeah. is not played up, totally. right? So it's yeah. like, if you're, if you're voting on abortion, either the right or the left, you, what do you, if, if all of a sudden the party stops making it a mainstream thing, maybe you stay home is the argument, but like... Yeah, well, it does seem if the right drops abortion from their... Like, it seems like that would be a winning thing for them. You don't think so? Oh, absolutely. Like, you, those evangelicals, I do, not, I do not believe that if you get rid of abortion from yeah, the platform, or at least yeah. highlighting it, that they're going to stay home in power because the reality is they're actually disproportionately in states anyways that are going to vote red. And so you, you don't actually need to worry too, too much. I mean, maybe Ohio or like Pennsylvania. I, I, don't, I don't know the exact states, Wisconsin, like where you need to really focus in on how do you drive as many people out. But yeah, I, I think, I think the parties that realize the culture war issues, they play well on Fox news and maybe they're good for donations. And maybe, maybe but, yeah. but I think, Put immigration to the side because I actually, the more I've talked to like people who understand Republican strategy, it's like the single strongest issue to get people to be excited about you is being hardcore anti-immigrant, illegal immigrant. Um, But even even like skilled immigration, people just don't want to hear the word immigrant or it's like they they say it's like we're going to preserve the way of life, even though all these people need immigrants in their town because there's not enough people to do the work. But I think that the the smart move is to tack away from the culture stuff. And just focus on economics, right? Cheaper housing, more readily available housing. The, the education thing has an economic component in the sense of like higher quality education, less woke education. Yep. You, you're setting your kids up for economic success. And then whatever the other policies of, of basically give people free stuff. And like, <laughs> that is, I think the winning, at, at least at the presidential level, right? Like, you know, if you're, if you're trying to be the center of Massachusetts, you got to play a completely different game. Um, but in and- terms of like, what do people want? It's, it's, they, they want more money. And, and it's like, you, you, there's a variety of ways to go do that. And I think, you know, DeSant- DeSantis's biggest flaw in his campaign is he, and, and, and part of this is also the primary process, but like, he really tacked into this like anti-woke when competence as a governor um, and, and keeping COVID, uh, Florida open during COVID and the schools. And like, I, I think that would have just been a way stronger platform. I mean, part, arguably Nikki Haley is the, the reason she's done as well is she kind of represents that like establishment Republican of, of competence, even though it's like, I don't know, she's a little milk toast. Yep. So, and the smart Democrats are, are doing that. Like our, you know, our friends, Noah Smith, Ezra Klein, they're, they're, they're de-emphasizing some of these identitarian stuff and they're focusing on, you know, what they call abundance, which is, you know, housing, healthcare, education, like there's convergence on the smart people on both sides are converging to, to the winning strategy. Uh-huh. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's only a winning strategy if you actually win with it, right? Exactly. But, I, but I think if I was to guess where the puck goes, it's, it's sell people on my platform, you get more, yep. Yep. right? You get a bigger chunk of the pie. Yep. And, and by de-emphasizing the identity politics component, it, it can actually, it, it's a like, oh, it, that can apply to me. Yep. Versus if you emphasize that, then I start to look at that going, wait, well, this is the party that's not going to help me. They're going to help all yes. these other people over here. Um, yeah. And so I, I think, I mean, Noah wrote a, an amazing post and, and, you know, I think decent critiques, but, but overall on California forever. Yeah. Just to think that like, you know, the default journal position on this project, and this is the new city in the Bay Area or yeah. right outside the Bay Area, 
was immediately to attack it and cabal and like all this kind of crap. And then now Noah, who I think is like, you know, way more intellectual and interesting than, than most of these journals is writing. It's like, this is awesome. Like we should be doing this. And so I do think back to your idea of a vibe shift. It, it is, it's a, it's a reset of kind of like, okay, we're, we're in a world where people are basically, you know, kind of talk about like the yield curve with, with yeah. treasuries. You know, you're looking 10 years into the future. I think people are already pricing Trump in and they're already pricing in Trump is like, actually, it's, we already know what a Trump presidency looks like. Um, and so they're, they're thinking beyond that. They're thinking it's like, what is, where is the direction for, for the different parties and, and what's the coalition platform that, you know, we should be building if I want, you know, my vision of the world to exist. And, and yeah. maybe it doesn't really start to crystallize for people until, you know, the, November, whatever, uh, of this year. And, and it kind of like, people are now kind of looking at the landscape of what does 2028 look like? Um, but yeah, I, I, I think if I was to say the biggest thing for 2024, obviously the biggest issue of the year is going to be the election. Yep. Um, I think rate cuts will be interesting, um, because I think the, the, the stock market like kind of ripped in December and in January and then kind of pulled back a bit on this, this a little bit higher, uh, inflation reading. And with this whole, you know, Houthis thing and, you know, does that actually affect prices? Probably, probably not. But so I think there might be a little bit more bumpiness to the soft landing. But I think that w one, one thing that's interesting, at least for tech with interest rate change, is if you get a few cuts, the market will kind of normalize back to, OK, what is what is the market believe the growth potential of tech companies should be worth? And so I think we're going to we're going to at least get a, like kind of like a reset in terms of. So we went from this like crazy 2021 where people, you know, were taking revenue for a company and extrapolating it out like insane multiples. And then with, with 2022 and, and, and last year, things got compressed a ton. And I think we're going to probably find some middle ground. And, and, and you know, again, it probably also be like, are you profitable versus just strictly revenue? But then it's actually going to have a huge impact on all of the startups that raised in 2021 with these big valuations and have kind of been hanging out for the last couple of years, hoping to kind of see what the window for the IPOs and things like that. But my, my bet is that it's not going to be as exciting as people are hoping. I think people have a lot of cope and think that we're going back to, you know, 20, 30 X and, and the reality is probably going to go from where maybe it is today, six, eight X to, 10 to 12. So still better, uh, and, you know, decent increase, but I, I don't think we're, we're going back to 2021 anytime soon. And, and so in that world, I think, I think we'll still continue to have a little bit more of this austerity measures. People don't feel as flush. People don't feel like the job market is as liquid. And I think that the other thing is if this AI stuff really plays out, and maybe it's not this year specifically, but overall over the next two, three years, you're just going to get a lot more leverage per employee. And this yeah. will especially affect startups, right? Like, uh, you know, and and we said we wanted to talk about the businesses today. Maybe maybe we can do a little bit update at the end. But so I have a team of twelve. Yeah, sir. you know, three years into the company, raised a bunch of money. I could go hire more people. Relative to what we're doing and and kind of the scope of what we have, relative to like when I was an early employee at Coinbase, we have no ops employees. Like I am, I am the op. I I, I have a you know kind of person in the Philippines that helps me. Uh, shout out to Athena, um, <laughs> and the. The thing is like Rippling, Mercury, Ramp, like these tools, just like all of the stuff that automatically feeds in on the financial side for us and, and the HR side of things. And like, you know, we, if I need to pay an international contractor, I just use Deal. Like I can actually assemble a bunch of stuff that in it, even 10 years ago, like would have required, okay, I need, I need to get an HR person because there's just yeah. all this ongoing stuff. Um, and so I, I think the AI stuff is only going to accelerate that from the early stage side of things. And so you're going to have this whole crop of companies that just never end up hiring for these roles. So I think it's less actually about like people replacing people with AI. And it's actually just the, it's, you just never hire the role or you, or you get way, you know, we hit a certain scale and we have one HR person doing the, doing the amount of work that, uh, you know, a team of seven used to do. And so I think you just get way more efficient companies from the beginning. And I think that just further compounds as these tools basically capture some of the value of what used to be a human in, in terms of revenue. Because I'm willing to pay someone $1,000 a year for a feature that can replace, you know, uh, a third of a, an HR employee, right? So that's like a really good trade for me. 
but like you know, that, that feature potentially you, the, the, so the deflationary component of that, I think is gonna be pretty significant. Uh, and so I, I think if you just kind of take that is you, you have this election, that's going to be big. And then I think you're just going to continue to have this reset in terms of Silicon Valley and people understanding of like, okay, what does excellent look like? How, how do I get treated in, in a public market, like an Apple, like a Microsoft? Um, obviously there's a scale component there, but I think it's, it's going to be more about like how efficient your company is. It is going to be much more it, growth will always be a component, but I think that that is what will be rewarded. And I think the smarter companies were just going to continue to keep cutting. Like yeah. I, I think, I think Elon showed this and I think no one actually went as dramatic, but I think probably most tech companies could have done a significant cut yeah. and actually within a year or two, if they just really worked on, on being as operationally efficient as possible would have probably been at or, or beyond where they were before. And obviously, that's way less uh, overhead in terms of uh, your ongoing. You know, yeah. Campus. There's a few other topics I wanted to get into. So maybe, maybe we could do a part two around sort of things that changed, you know, in the past year in, in prediction 2024. One was foreign policy. The other is AI and specifically like intra Silicon Valley civil war as it relates to, to AI. And I also want to talk about our businesses. I, I want to be mindful of, of your time. Do you have like 15 more minutes? Maybe, oh, yeah, we can, we can do that. Let's okay. just try to do cool. lightning round. I mean, we tend to rant, yeah. but that's... Yeah, yeah. So, let's, let's, so maybe let's, let's um, cause make sure we get to it. Let, let's get an update on, on the businesses. So Farcaster, I think the last time we did it, we did an update. My, our understanding of the, of the business was, hey, um, the problems with Twitter were sort of, you know, a lot of speech censorship and developers couldn't build on, on, on top of it. Uh, with with Elon, maybe things have changed on the speech censorship, but not really on the on the build on top of it. If anything, it's, it's gotten worse. I, I've had some friends try to use the API. They got cut off. And so I, what I see with the forecaster is the community continues to be growing, um, but even, even, uh, but you you have a lot of people starting to build on top of it. People starting to build things that are raising money. Why don't you update us on, 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 on the journey of forecaster? Yeah, so I think... We're, what's going well is we have a vibrant, active community like we, that, that is growing, so that that's good, right? If it was declining, then then you have a real real issue. But I think where we're most challenged is just it's a scale game with social, and, and we just are so small, like in terms of the total number of active users. And so this year is is all in on figuring out growth, um, and so we're actually de-emphasizing a bunch of other things that in the past, like been working a little bit more on the technical decentralized side of things. We're in a sufficient place there. And so the, the goal is to move this from being a science experiment is how I like to call it. It's like, yes, the whole technology stack works. Um, and we have reason to believe it can scale really well, but it doesn't matter if you can't actually get the people to push it to the limit on the scaling side of things. And so focusing on, on how do we continue to grow daily active users, which is just an absolute grind and brutal. And I think where we, um, are, are in a more difficult place than typical social networks is if you think about social networks is you really only hear about the successful ones. And so if you think about it, it's like 10,000 people go ten, start 10,000 social networks. You end up hearing about the five that actually figured out the growth scene that like really taps into some innate consumer behavior or, or kind of like unmet consumer need and then grows from there. And I think where we are is we're still too much in a clone space of, of Twitter, although it feels a little bit more like Reddit at these, these days because we have this feature called channels. And I think where we're trying to figure out is what are the iterations we can actually do to some of these core primitives that might actually tap into a new need for people that they didn't even know existed. Uh, and that, that's the big thing with consumer. Like if, if I learned anything in the last three years is, is the Henry Ford quote of like, I asked my customers what they wanted, they would have wanted a faster course is when you're building consumer products, um, at least new experiences and, and, and products people spend time on rather than like something that solves a specific need. It's like, if I have a water bottle, like obviously the water bottle, like just does it actually work? Um, but even there, it's like Stanley water bottles, like, okay, that's that's the same water bottle, but basically just marketing. And so I think it's, it's figuring out um, kind of what a consumer doesn't even know that they want uh, and, and then being able to offer it to them. And so we've, we've been unable to do that outside of like a core group of people for, uh, I think, more ideological reasons have found Farcaster to be interesting. So, the, the, but to your point, the thing that is actually kind of interesting is even though we're small, like we actually have a lot of developer activity because the APIs are completely open. And so I'm, I'm less bullish on that other developers are going to come up with the killer app use case. I think that's a little bit cope because the 
if if the developer could come up with the use case that could grow the user base, they would just do it themselves. Like they don't they don't really need the decentralized component of things. And so I think if we can significantly scale the user base, call it something like 100x over over the next year, 18 months, then I think we're actually at a sufficient size that the developer can go build the app, build a reasonable like early user base because Farcaster is providing them a kind of captive audience for potential users. And the analogy I always use here is the iPhone, right? It's like I, the, an app developer, Instagram does not have to figure out how to sell you a phone. Like you've already bought the phone. You already have the app store set up. It's a few taps and you're on Instagram. And then the device has the sensors for you and all the things that you need to make that experience great. And so um, I think that's the big thing with a platform is you need to do the hard work to figure out the at least the initial killer apps to, to drive uh, that early user base so that it's sufficiently large that now it becomes attractive for a business. Windows, iPhone, it, it's it's the kind of same game. Um, and I think, so yeah, that, that's that's where I'm heads down focused. And everything else after that doesn't doesn't really matter for, for broadcast. What about oh, yeah. Turpentine? Well, well, just a quick come on, comments on that. I feel like you're you're selling yourself short. I was talking to Linda Xi, who's building Bounty Caster. And uh, on top of Farcaster, it's sort of marketplace for bounties, which I thought was really interesting and inspired me to do something like that for references just as an experiment. And um, it seems to be a bunch of activity. And I was like, hey, why is this Why is this built on top of Farcaster? Why don't you just build it your, yourself uh, or just bu- build it independently? And she said, oh, this is great community, like early users. Like if I was just to launch it on Twitter, how, how am I going to get an early user base that's already a community that already knows each other or has a this sort of reputational economy? Um, so. I feel like uh, you're selling yourself short and that people are already finding it valuable, even with the user base that, that it has um, in terms of building on, on, on top of it, being able to leverage that graph. Yeah. So do, is there something valuable there? Sure. Is it, is it venture scale valuable? No. So that, that's, I, 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 intellectual honesty is important yes. to me as much as the commenters might, yes. might claim that <laughs> intellectual bankrupt, but like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, so I, I'm happy that it, Linda finds it useful and is a good place, but, I think Linda would be even happier if we had 100x the users because right. it's that many more people who would potentially be exposed to Bounty Caster. Yeah. So what 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 is the highest? How do you get even 10x users? Like, what is the highest leverage? What have you found? Eric, if, you- I, if I had that answer to you, I wouldn't even be on the podcast. I'd be working on it right now. So I, I think it's it's we we're going to try a bunch of experiments yeah. this year. Um, you know, I, I basically don't do any external stuff. Yeah. I actually think that that's low ROI in terms of marketing. This is basically my only external thing yeah. that I do. And it, this is more of a yeah. hobby and we do it once yeah. a week. Um, but I think the the thing that's going to happen is spending time using the product. I spend a ton yeah. of time using the product and trying to kind of tease out some of the organic behaviors that there's a lot of interesting and, and fascinating people and what they're doing on Farcaster. Yeah. And so finding something that's organically happening and saying, if I built a, a feature or a product around this behavior, um, maybe, maybe we can use that as a growth factor. So one, one area that I tried last fall is I, I leveraged my network and got a bunch of high profile AMAs. And you, you basically can't do this on Twitter for these people, like especially in crypto, because they would just be overwhelmed with spam. Yeah. But on a forecaster, you don't have that. And so I did one with Vitalik, Brian Armstrong, uh, Fred Wilson, Balaji, uh, so Gary Tan. So, so people loved them from like an execution standpoint, like got tons of great feedback on them. Didn't drive growth. So like, I think it, what I, I, I have an allergic reaction when anyone, somebody's like, Oh, you're doing a great job with Farcaster. It's like, fine, great. Like we, we've made progress, but if, if you can't figure out how to actually make it venture scale, if, if you're playing a venture game, which, which we are, uh, it's a participation trophy, and you know I I don't want a participation trophy. I want I want, I want a big trophy. Yeah, and um, yeah. Just as a as a user, I, I want to say I um I recently discovered channels, and I I think that's just so brilliant. I um I don't know why Twitter doesn't do that to the degree that you guys are doing it. Um, because yeah, it just makes it such a great you know fe- way to find people who are you know, interested in the exact same thing that you're interested in and want to talk about it. Yeah. So Twitter has this feature called communities. It's always been a neglected stepchild. I, I think Twitter has actually had a lot of interesting ideas that never kind of got executed in, in maybe the right way. And, and talking to people who used to be at Twitter is a lot of dysfunction from a management standpoint, uh, pre-Elon and then post-Elon, uh, depending on uh, how you view it. But my sense is so channels is, is kind of like a, the pitch is like a subreddit, but with the Twitter UI, uh, there is an MOZ channel. Um, yeah. So we're a little bit more active there. So if you're listening yeah. to the podcast and you're not on Farcaster, yeah, please join. Yeah, 
download Warpcast, and then you should be able to onboard. You don't even need any crypto to start. Uh, it's pretty straightforward to sign up. Yeah. Let's, let's, actually, let's do a quick turpentine because I yeah, got to sure. run soon. Yeah. Well, the last thing I'll say is I, I want to do an AMA episode. Uh, I solicit questions on Farcaster and maybe have even people come in and ask them to us live. So maybe we'll do that um, next time or, or, or soon. Yeah. Or you could async, have someone submit video, and then we can yeah. download them all oh, like, yeah. and pause it. So that way you just you can kind yeah. of just have someone go through all of that. Yeah. Let's do that. Okay, tur turpentine. Uh, I think similarly, you know, we, uh, sometimes people say we're doing a great job, but I think we're 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 just starting. Um, we have fourteen shows. We do four hundred thousand downloads a month. In December, we did three hundred k in revenue. Um, but we're we're just a podcast network, uh, you know. So I, I want us to be a full fledged uh, media company. Uh, it was like you know TechCrunch in its heyday. Uh, I, I just tweeted that by the end of Q one, I want us to have launched a suite of new sort of. Uh, formats or products within Turpentine. So I want us to cover fundraise announcements, launch announcements. I want us to do uh, to hire analysts for different sectors and do company breakdowns, mar market maps. I want us to get us in. I want us to get us in, in, get in the list game, like you know, curating uh, best uh, best funds per sector or best investors per sector, best companies per sector, best executives, um, and really uh, our first conference really get in the game of uh, not just distribution on one format, but also kind of, def you know, where the important conversations happen, uh, where news breaks, where reputations are, are defined. And then my goal is to build a data business on top of that um, and an investing practice on top. Sort of like, you know, Mike Arrington built TechCrunch and then also uh, there was Crunchbase and there was, which is the data product, um, and there was CrunchFund. I, I want to have more success that, than he did, although. I think he's a pioneer and he's, he's done phenomenally well. Um, and so we're, we're, you know, it's still day one. We're a team of five. We're, we're hiring aggressively now that we're profitable. I, I did a, a pretty big loan to the business, big for me, loan into the business. We paid it off. Now we're making money. And hopefully by the next month or two, we'll have uh, doubled our, our team of, you know, we're five now. So that's the, that's the turpentine update. That's great. I mean, I think the velocity of new experimentation is is commendable, and and I think like one critique I have, I have you know a lot of people I've made angel investments in, and so one is people send investor updates or they don't. I think it's it's crazy if you don't have product market fit and or even like a board and you haven't you're not sending an investor update like once a month. And I have put my template out there before. If you want my template for investor updates, which is extremely easy to do. You should reply me on Farcaster. Don't don't do YouTube comments. Uh, so sign up and just add reply me. TWR. Um, and so I think that is crazy. So you don't have these people giving updates. And then the second thing is just like when you don't have users or uh, even frankly a team, like your rate of updates should just be insane. Like you should be pushing new updates. You know, and if you're one person, fine. You're going to move a little slower, but just just reduce scope. And so I think like. I think there are way too many people who are overthinking like, oh, what should I work on or do? And, and, and the reality is like, no, it's about like, like being in the arena is not sitting there thinking about it. It's, it's like, try stuff, yeah. um, you know, as, as, as our friend Shamath <laughs> would say. So like the trying stuff is the important part. Um, and so it's, it's crazy to me. And then like, I think uh, as a, just an aside, uh, and maybe this is actually relevant for Turpentine. Um, I think with GPT stuff now, and, and and the tutorials that exist out there. So you can get like kind of even an okay engineer and actually be able to execute on things. Yeah. It's crazy to me people don't more invest more in, in mobile apps uh, for just like smaller projects because usage on Farcaster is like 80% mobile. And what do most people do in crypto? They They launch a desktop app. And then they're like, oh, why is no one using my app? It's like, yes, because most people use the leisure consumer apps when they are just kind of chilling, like they're, they put their kids down, they're going to sit and veg on the couch. They're going to, even if they're watching TV, they, they're scrolling. They, they, they have something in their phone. Uh, and if you think that you're like a little progressive website or like some website, no, like it's like they need a push notification. They need the thing on their screen. And so it's like, I think more aggressive strategies around, they don't have to be that complex. Right, like I, in some ways, I would be more apt to check out more Turpentine shows if there was a Turpentine mobile app that was just literally just a list of the shows and it deep linked into the app store. Yeah. And so I think like mobile, if if your game is attention, 
and you don't have like a really locked down mobile strategy and you're just like praying that the Twitter algo or the YouTube algo is going to like bring you, yeah. you know, distribution or whatever, or somehow you have a desktop website and people are actually going to use it at the rate that you want them. No, yeah. it's, it's like maybe Vision Pro will change some of this, but I think it's, it's too pricey and, and like, um, you know, it'll, it'll kind of be an early adopter thing before it gets bigger. But like mobile, mobile, mobile is all I ever say to people. And so that would be my push to you is like, how am I spending more time thinking about turpentine? In terms of like, I have five minutes to kill. Like, is it the potentially one of the most interesting things that I could go open? Yeah. Right. Like Substack's app actually made me want to like just browse Substacks more versus opening my email is stressful. Whereas yeah. opening the Substack app is like, oh, there's just like a bunch of interesting intellectual content here. I'll tap into this and, and read it. Yeah. So. No, that's a good push. We, we, we're not yet a tech company. We're just a media company, but I would like to become a tech company and we're small enough where we could, you know, we could still, we could start hiring some engineers and do that. So that's a, that's a good push. I, sh I, sh I should do that. Yeah. But, uh, but my push would say, get a contractor or whatever, yeah. and you don't even need to be a tech company. It's just like you right. put a simple wrapper. It's it just think of it as like a higher fidelity, like a uh, better quality, like experience of a, a website. Yeah. And you could just be pulling in the, the RSS feeds for all these uh, podcasts. And so yep. it's just like a stream of everything Turpentine is doing. You can feed your Substacks in there. You could do that kind of, like, I think basically that's like my big push to entrepreneurs is like get in front of consumers and consumers spend all their time on mobile. Um, yeah. Unless you're building like enterprise software, which yes, then they sit at their desk Monday through Friday and then they don't use the app on the weekends. Yeah, totally. And um, the last thing I'll say, I'll let you, let you go. It's great, great, great advice is, um, you know, we're not raising VC because I don't think media companies should raise VC and we're in a fortune position where we're making money. We don't have to, but um, we, we do want to have a VC like outcome. Um, and so people often, uh, you know, will call businesses that don't look like they should raise VC lifestyle businesses and assume that the outcome will be smaller. We, we hope to be almost post VC in, 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 in some way, like our, um, you know, uh, in, in the sense that we don't need it, but hopefully, you know, like a MailChimp or like uh, any of these other, you know, Zapier or any of these other companies. How about, about MidJourney? 200 million in revenue? Exactly. Elon's exactly. like, Elon's throwing shout outs to the founder. Like, yeah. that, that's a pretty good post VC business. Yes, exactly. Right? That's, that's so so I, I, I think with the deflationary impact, I'm not like Chamath level crazy where right. it's like, oh yeah, I'll just get one engineer and we'll right. rebuild Stripe. Like, come on, like that's just, yeah. that's, that's <laughs> extreme. But I do think that there's something in his 80, 90 incubator, yeah, which, you know, for those who don't know, it's, it's, he's going to get you 80% of the features for 90% discount. I think it's like maybe a little too extreme, but, but I do think that there is something for if, if you, if you already have an audience, okay, yeah. which you do, Eric, and, and yeah. through your, your kind of this, this podcast yeah. network, you're actually building a bigger and bigger audience and you can cross sell different things. Yeah. I actually think there is really high leverage in building whether it's an app or something that actually can kind of further drive attention in, into into that in a way that five years ago you would have needed like a team of three you need a designer android engineer you know ios engineer and then it's like someone's got to be product managing it versus at this point i think things are only going to get better in terms of people be able to experiment with more niche software right and if, if you never have more than i don't know two million people using that but you own 100 percent of that business and you know you're yep. able to make a hundred million dollars a year off that like that's amazing and yeah. and the person i would say is dave portnoy right yeah and 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 actually like he he gets to do whatever he wants exactly and 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 he's just built this massive empire which he then was able to buy back for a dollar um like i i think more mr beast right so so i i think audience and this is this is my biggest pitch for farcaster is the more you have direct relationship with your audience and, and kind of sovereignty with your audience on a long term, that's extremely valuable from a compounding standpoint. Yeah. Right. And and so I, I think audience, people underrate audience because they dismiss it as influencer. But like, I don't know, we should have Austin Allred on our, our podcast. Yeah. One of the reasons he said is he uses Twitter. It's like a huge growth channel for uh, Bloom School. Yeah. Bloom Tech. Yep. Yeah. But 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 I think like that is it, it, people dismiss audience because it's oriented towards celebrity or it seems vapid, but, you know, people talk about Kim Kardashian. It's like, yes, the reason she, yeah. or, or, you know, uh, whatever, who, who, who's um, Kylie, right? The one with the yeah, makeup, Rihanna, makeup. Taylor Swift. What, what is it? Fundamentally it's, it's yes, you have something that you're doing, but when, especially when you're, you don't maybe have the music talent, like the, the ones yeah. I cited at the beginning, the audience is the thing that you're actually using yeah. to build businesses. 
And yeah. that's actually the hard part. It's getting people's attention and then, and then translating them into customers. Totally. And so I actually think like, Media is this kind of thing that failed from a VC standpoint in the, in the 2010s, BuzzFeed being the most prominent yeah. example. But I actually think it's like, no, it's like anything that you can get people's attention, that is such a hard thing to do. Yeah. That is really, really valuable to be able to push other totally. things, assuming you have the ability to go execute. Yeah. Jake Paul is making like hundreds of millions off of his energy drink. Like, and, and then he also got this, this betting platform as another example. And we, we're mentioning right now B2C creators, and I'm excited about B2B creators who are not just going to create the next energy drink or the next whatever, but if they have an audience of product managers or audience of VCs, maybe they create the next Carta or incubate the next Carta um, or actually like marketplaces or, or software platforms that they could you know, team up with great engineers and then sell to their, their audience and build these better margin or you know, more software-like businesses. So that, that's, a, that's a trend that I'm trying to ride. And, and maybe to cap this all off, why is All In still going? If, if you want my real take on it, That's it's okay. not, they don't make money. They don't do the ads. Yeah. They realize how powerful that audience is in terms yeah. of all of the things that each one of them is trying to do. Right. And yeah, they always beep out certain things, but the reality is how many more people are now going to be exposed to, you know, David Freeberg's new thing. Yeah. And yes, are those going to be the end consumers? Probably not, but maybe talented people want to go work there. Yeah. That That's yeah. super valuable. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, Chamath, is now like adding this like newsletter where he's like, yeah. you know, he's, he's all this money, but the reality is he, he, his image is so valuable from that podcast yeah. and even Sachs. I'm sure there are going to be entrepreneurs who hear about craft ventures as a result of that. And they like the, the and LPs kind of, and yeah. Yeah. So, so I think, and not to mention Jake, who I think benefits more than anybody else from this podcast, but yeah. they're trying to hire a CEO because why? Cause they have the attention. They want to do these summits and, 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 you know, they're realizing, huh, you know, Ted is woke. And that it, it seemed to play like they talked about Davos this week. Yeah. Not that all in is going to replace Ted or Davos, because I don't think it's going to appeal to the certain type of professional managerial class. But I think ultimately attention, if you have people's attention, everything else is downstream, right? Like yeah. upstream is like the fact that you're listening to this podcast, this is valuable to the both of us in the sense that we can propagate our ideas out yeah. um, and it compounds, right? Because the YouTube algorithm keeps getting yeah. us followers. The biggest difference, though, is if we said the wrong thing and YouTube decided to get rid of us, we don't actually own our audience, right? We don't have a newsletter as much as I tell you, Eric, that we should have one. We'll have it's one. Like really driving people to newsletters so we make sure we could keep talking to you. So instead, you know, we, we say things that, you know, eight out of 10 rather than the 10 out of 10 slice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let, let, let's wrap on that. Just the last thing I'll end with is, uh, you know, the first show we ever did was Moment of Zen, and that really uh, helped set Turpentine off. So um, I'm grateful to you for, uh, for helping, uh, helping make that happen. Likewise, I love I love doing it. Awesome. Until next time. Cheers.